speaking for about 45 minutes on stage in Central Park today, Secretary Hillary Clinton made her first on-camera public comments about the Helsinki summit between President Trump and Russian President Vladimir Putin. In front of a few thousand people at Ozzy Fest, a political festival, Clinton criticized President Trump for trying to go above and beyond to be friends with Putin. She insinuated that President Trump was unprepared for the meeting. She said Trump did not have vigorous debate or discussions with his advisors about Russia before the meeting because if he did, he would not have even considered to allow Russia to interrogate a former U.S. ambassador to Moscow, Michael McFaul, an idea Putin proposed during the summit. The idea that the president even considered for a nanosecond turning over a former ambassador to Russia, to Russia, Mike yeah. McFaul, was simply unbelievable. And in this case, it doesn't seem like our president cares. He wants to be friends with Putin for reasons that we're all still trying to figure out. Clinton also thinks the White House should not have allowed President Trump to meet one-on-one -on -one with Russian President Vladimir Putin alone. She says it's alarming that the White House, in her opinion, has allowed Russian President Putin to dictate to the world what was said in that private meeting. You can have one-on-ones, as they're called, with friendly leaders, um, and that has happened. You need others in there, and you particularly need a note-taker, so that there can be no mistake about what was said. Clinton's comments today come just two days after Trump tweeted, Will the Dems and fake news ever learn this is classic? And attached was a 10-second video clip in which Hillary Clinton says the U.S. wants very much to have a strong, prosperous, stable Russia. Clinton responded, noting the clip was a 2010 interview in which the president of Russia at the time was reformist Dmitry Medvedev. She tweeted a video in which she has tougher words for Putin and calls Trump a Kremlin puppet. Those two are still at it. <laughs>
With some of the people who are on the front lines trying to reunify parents with their children uh, who have been separated from them, and the first time I ever met a migrant child was when I was very, very young. I was probably about 11, and my church had asked me if I would, with two other girls, go out on Saturdays and babysit the little kids, the toddlers, um, and the young school-age kids, uh, because the older kids had to go into the fields with their parents to pick crops, and this was in the Midwest, where migrant labor would end up by the end of the summer and, and into September. So I remember so vividly my friends and I playing games with these kids, serving them lunch, and then at the end of the day, around about this time, a bus came down the dirt road uh, near where the migrant camp was, and the doors opened, and these little kids all knew that their mothers and fathers and their big brothers and sisters were on that bus. And they broke loose and they started running down that road, yelling for their moms and their dads, and the parents were getting off the bus after a really hard day of work, and scooping up those kids. And, and Lorene, I remember looking at that, and I don't know why, as an 11-year-old, it made such an impression on me, but I thought, you know, that's what I used to do when I was a little kid. I was 11, so I was thinking like when I was three or four. When I was a little kid and my dad would come home from work and I would run out. So part of what I've always tried to do because of my family and my faith and my belief in service is to find ways where we give everybody a chance and where we try to even the odds. So whether it's kids with disabilities or kids that are denied adequate schooling or adequate health care. And I've always thought that's what our country stood for, that we stood for yeah. providing those mm -hmm. ladders that would give people a chance to have a better life. And, and, you know, it's not very complicated for me. It's what we do to try to help each other because at the end, uh, that's really what matters. Um, well, since you brought it up, let's talk a little bit about how immigration has become an ugly word and, and a demonized sector. And the, the most ugly part of it has just been made visible with family separation where, where young toddlers and children have been torn from their parents and many of these parents have already been deported and the children were kept in cages and uh, uh, the parents were kept generally hundreds if not thousands of miles from them. And even now, the reunification of the parents with their children is very complicated and not happening swiftly. And uh, there are two faith organizations, the, the Lutheran Services and the U.S. Council on Bishops, who've been tasked with reuniting children with their families and without any funding, by the way. So maybe you could talk a little bit about um, how you think at lay people, American citizens who actually care about this can get involved and, and help be part of the solution? Well, I think there are lots of ways we can get involved. I mean, a lot of the organizations that are trying to reunite families and provide services, particularly for traumatized children, um, need help. They need Spanish speaking, social workers, lawyers, others who can try to come and, and provide some additional support, even if it's just for a long weekend or a week off from work. They need extra funding. You mentioned uh, the Catholic Charities and the Lutheran Church are bearing a big burden for trying to work to create uh, the best circumstances for these families. There are a lot of other groups. Um, on my Twitter feed, there's a a list of groups that we raised money for, about 10 or 12 of them, and there's others that need support, and I'm going to be tweeting about this in the days to come because there's a lot of things. If any of you work for an airline, I hope you'll let me know, direct message me, because we need to get vouchers and discounted tickets to bring these families back yeah. together across that thousand miles. So there's a lot to be done. Mm -hmm. um, so as, as we dive into issues of the day, I think one of the, the most perplexing ones is the, the role of Russia and um, how President Trump has 
has disavowed and taken a long time to come around to accepting what the intelligence community has been telling him. Um, right. We should we should talk later about changing the electoral college and and <laughs> what that would mean. I appreciate it. As a Californian, uh, I would like my vote to count. Um, however, however, uh, I think I think that the whole audience would be really grateful to hear you um, kind of step back for a minute and walk us through. Russia's cyber attacks and their meddling in our electoral process and and kind of help us to make sense of this situation that we're in now. Well, it, it's, it's really distressing and alarming, um, and it should concern every single American, whether you are of a political party or not, um, because this was a direct attack on our democracy. And, you know, we had some hints of that back in the summer of 2016 and then uh, leading into the election in October when our intelligence uh, professionals tried to say enough without causing panic or creating a backlash about what was going on. But it didn't really become clear until starting in January 2017 uh, when uh, the intelligence community did a, a pretty comprehensive report and briefed the president-elect about that report, and they had great detail uh, about who had done what and that it was indeed ordered by Vladimir Putin. Now, if you're following this, you know that uh, the special counsel, Bob Mueller, has issued uh, an indictment a few, about a week ago, of uh, a number of Russian military uh, officials and with very specific detail what they did and how they did it. We probably don't know everything they did. We do know that they stole emails through spear phishing, which uh, is a common form of hacking. Mm -hmm. uh, we knew that they penetrated into the electoral systems of a number of states. And in the Mueller indictment, we learned that they stole information about 500,000 voters from uh, a state not yet identified. We know that they stole not only emails, but they stole uh, data, what's called analytics, uh, from the Democratic National Committee that was serving as the basis for decisions that were being made in the last months of the presidential campaign. We know that the so-called uh, source of this, um, somebody called Guccifer, was actually a Russian military intelligence operative. And we know from the indictment that one member or one congressional candidate contacted Guccifer for information about his opponent. And there's a lot of other things. If you're interested in this, it's really worth reading the indictment because it's filled with so much detail. Now, what does all this mean? Well. I think it's fair to say that it means that this was a very broad and unfortunately successful cyber attack on our electoral system. The director of national intelligence appointed by the president, a man named Dan Coates, who's been an ambassador, a member of the Senate, testified not very long ago and said that the alarms should be sounding right now, that there is sufficient evidence that the Russians are back into our systems. But that's not all. I mean, the attack on our election goes to the real heart of democracy, but we also know they have been probing and gathering information about critical infrastructure, our electric grid, our airline traffic system, um, our water system, nuclear power plants. And there are four main adversaries when it comes to cyber that we have to worry about, Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. If any one of them gets away with the kind of attack that Russia did, that only empowers them and gives them more reason to keep probing and possibly uh, damaging or destroying 
uh, certain institutions uh, in our economy as well as in our, our government. Now, the great mystery is why the president has not spoken up for our country. Yes. And we saw that most clearly in this recent uh, yes. meeting with in Putin. House, okay. We don't know what was said in uh, the room where just the two of them. And, and by the way, is that yeah. unprecedented that a president goes in without without any other foreign policy advisors directly with another I, president? I think it, it, it is at that level. I mean, you can have one-on-ones, as they're called, with friendly leaders, um, and that has happened. But I, I don't know of a precedent. I, I, you know, I met with Putin and President Obama uh, several times. I met with with Putin and, you know, one or two others. Um, so usually you, you, you need others in there and you particularly need a note taker so that there can be no mistake about what was said. Uh -huh. And what's happening now, Lorene, is that Putin is basically uh, telling the world what was decided. You know, he has been giving press statements, he's calling in Russian ambassadors to other countries, he's reaching out to other leaders, and he's basically saying, well, here's what we decided, and we're hearing crickets from the White House. Nothing is being put out that is in any way contradictory or replacing the Putin agenda with whatever Trump was doing. So it's, it's alarming, and it's alarming on many, many levels. And the final thing I would say is make no mistake this is a direct attack on our democracy. And, you know, I think we've done uh, pretty well for ourselves being a nation of free people. And over time, we've solved a lot of our problems. We've opened more opportunities to more people. And so this idea that somehow we are not sure where our own president stands is deeply disturbing. And. The best way to deal with that is to vote in November. Um, following the Helsinki meeting, I'm, gonna, I'm going to read this quote directly. Madeleine Albright, um, a former Secretary of State, uh, asked, quote, does anybody say to him, to the president, what in God's name were you thinking about when you did that? Because somebody needs to make it clear to Trump that his behavior in that press conference was un-American, outrageous, ridiculous, and stupid. As, as, so, as Secretary of State, is it the secretary's job to speak truth to power as uncomfortable and difficult as that might be? And I assume it is based on what you were just describing to us. So what advice would you give to the current secretary of state, Mr. Pompeo, uh, as he has his, his advisories with President Trump? Well, I don't think there's any doubt that Vladimir Putin has a very clear strategy you know, he didn't uh, come to his position, which he's now held off and on for 18 years, um, without some ideas that he is trying to pursue. And as a former KGB spy, he is quite adept at reading people and understanding how to manipulate them. And he's used a number of tools, including violence and assassination and poisoning, um, as well as money, uh, bribes, extortion, blackmail. The whole what's called active measures uh, toolkit has been used uh, by him. And it's no surprise, he and I did not exactly get along. Um, but to be fair, uh, hardly anybody who believes in freedom uh, gets along with him uh, because he is always trying to dominate and intimidate and direct how people and nations behave. So bottom line is there are a number of people in positions like this, uh, the Secretary of State, like the Director of National Intelligence who just spoke out at a conference uh, in Aspen the other day and you know, basically made clear he was not consulted about how that meeting would go and he certainly wasn't consulted about, about, invitation. about an invitation for Putin to come uh, in the fall. And, you know, 
having been in a position um, of that kind of responsibility, I I've always been around people um, who wanted to know what you knew and wanted to hear your opinion, as President Obama did, and then you would have a, a vigorous discussion. He wouldn't always agree with me or anybody else, but you would have that opportunity to say, well, I'm, I, you know, I don't know if that's a good idea, or here's what I think we should do. And he would then take it all in and thoughtfully digest it and make a decision. They're not even having meetings about this in this White House. You know, they don't get together and say, okay, how do we game this out? Putin is definitely going to Helsinki with an agenda. He's obviously, if he comes, coming here with an agenda. And you educate each other, including the president, about everything he might be thinking or asking for so you're ready uh, to reject the idea that the president even considered for a nanosecond turning over a former ambassador to Russia, to Russia, Mike yeah. McFaul, was simply unbelievable. And enough of an outcry happened that they backed off and, and said they wouldn't do it. But what's he doing talking about that anyway? You know, Putin always, you know, look, he's a very aggressive guy. He always pushes, pushes. He's aggressive in one-on-ones. He's aggressive in groups. It's the whole way he carries himself. And you have to be ready to say, well, you know, no, we don't agree with that. Or, or no, we're not going to do that. Or what about this? But if you don't even know what he's coming to ask for, how are you prepared to do that? And in this case, it doesn't seem like our president cares. He wants to be friends with Putin for reasons that we're all still trying to figure out. Um, what do you think is Putin's ultimate goal? <clears throat> you know, his ultimate goal is to dominate his neighborhood again, to dominate what used to be Eastern Europe behind the so-called Iron Curtain, mm -hmm. to dominate Central Asia, to have a foothold in the Middle East, which is a large part of what his uh, support of Assad in Syria is intended to do, to break up NATO, to break up the EU, to sow as much dissension and instability inside democracies. It's not just American elections or American politicians that he has gone after. He's done the same thing in Europe. And so he wants to undo the architecture of the post-World War II world. You know, we fought the bloodiest two wars in global history in the 20th century. And part of the ways that our grandparents and great-grandparents decided that would never happen again is to try to bind people together, you know, try to create common interests and common shared values. And we wanted a Europe that was whole and free and at peace. That is not in his interest. He thrives on, you know, divisiveness, and he uses every possible tool that he has. So I think what we have to be aware of is his attacks on our electoral system were intended to help Trump. That's been established. But it was also intended to create this divisiveness, to have us not trusting each other, to all of a sudden have Americans turning against each other. And they're still at that. I mean, they're still using agents and bots and all kinds of means of trying to create dissension. And we have to reject that. And, and are people concerned about the midterm elections and their involvement in that? People are concerned. I mean, I think that several of the intelligence professionals, including Dan Coates, the director of national intelligence, has said the Russians are still at it. And they are still looking for ways to steal information about voter registration, for example. There are some tech experts in Silicon Valley, Valley with whom I have met who say that you know, maybe what they'll do this next time is to really disrupt the actual election, shut down the servers that you send results to, uh, interfere with the operation of voting machines, because still too many of them are linked to the Internet. So there, we are still very vulnerable, and we don't have leadership from the administration, and we have begrudging support from the Republican majority in Congress. And a lot of states are 
you know, not doing as much as they should be doing. So part of the challenge is to do whatever we can now to prevent them from disrupting our election and sowing discord, um, and then to defeat them and, and begin to take back control over our government and our election system in a nonpartisan way, not to favor anybody, but to restore confidence in it and to let people trust ourselves again and try to end this bitter, incredibly negative political atmosphere we find ourselves in. And so I'm hoping that between now and November, people will be encouraged to vote. And then afterwards, we will have a Congress, one or both houses, that will begin to hold the administration accountable and fix what the Russians have done. Bravo. Um, so we have Russia, North Korea, the Iran nuclear deal, the Paris Climate Accords, alienating our allies in Canada and NATO, um, trade wars now erupting. How much damage is being done, in your opinion, to America's standing in the world? Well, well I think a lot of damage has been done in two different ways. I think for our allies, primarily in Europe and Canada, Japan, um, South Korea, there's a lot of confusion and a lot of worry about what the administration is doing, what it stands for. Uh, and there's a natural pulling back because people don't know what to expect. And we saw that on full display in the last NATO meeting and in the presidential visit to uh, the UK. And, and that has long-term effects because if people stop trusting you and they stop trusting your intentions and they no longer rely on you, which is now what Europeans and others are saying, they begin to make other arrangements. And, yeah. you know, the EU just signed a, a trade treaty with Japan. Mm -hmm. And, you and know... China's and China's stepping into the void. And, and, then, and then you show weakness. You know, if, if you can't carry a strategy forward, or it appears you have none except something that is kind of almost emotionally driven, um, then you've got adversaries like China and like Russia, but particularly China, who step in to fill that void. And the United States has been a Pacific power for a very long time and has helped to rebuild uh, the huge area that that represents after the Second World War has done a great deal to support uh, democracy in places like South Korea and Japan and elsewhere, and has been key in helping China modernize its economy, which in most ways is good for um, all of us. But if you begin to step back and you leave a void you know, it's just natural that somebody's going to fill it. So in Asia, China's filling it. Um, <clears throat> in Europe, I think our allies are trying to come up with new ways of uh, relating to one another and figuring out how to deal with their internal problems. So pretty soon, we become less relevant mm. and less able to act in our own interest. I mean, even assuming there was some coherent strategy behind what is happening now, which I don't see, um, you would hope that it would be a strategy that would end up with greater American uh, involvement in the world, greater economic growth that would be more broadly shared here in the United States, a continuing example uh, from our country about what human rights really means, you know, all the things that we thought we were trying to do, and that I certainly, as a senator and as a Secretary of State believed was part of our mission. So I, I guess it's fair to say that we're losing friends and allies who are worried about what we might do next, and we're leaving vacuums for others to fill okay. who may or may not have any of the same uh, interests and goals that we have. So as a student of history and a former elected official and a great patriot, in your mind, 
What should the role of the United States be in the 21st century in the world? We, we should be a, a model for how a big, diverse, pluralistic society thrives together. I mean, our diversity is one of our strongest assets in the 21st century. And, you know, change is always hard. I mean, I understand that. I, I you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not the, you know, excluding myself from saying that, you know, anything that changes causes a little bit of discomfort. You get out of your comfort zone and you wonder, well, is it going to work or not? We have decades and decades and decades of proof that absorbing immigrants, creating yes. opportunities yes. that take advantage of our diversity, opening the doors, changing the Constitution, fighting a civil war, <laughs> fighting the civil rights movement, having the women's movement, the gay rights movement, all of that has been to our advantage. And for those who want to turn the clock back on that and say somehow that has hurt America, they are just not walking around with their eyes open. They are living Bravo. in a very narrow understanding of what has already made us great. But, you know, you can't take any of that for granted. You have to keep working on it every single day. And so we need to be our own example, not only to the world, but to ourselves. And yes, we do have to fix the incredible disadvantages economically that too many of our own people uh, encounter because the economy is not working for everybody. And there's a lot we could do that would create greater and quicker movement toward more uh, economic uh, opportunities, good jobs, rising incomes, so that the, you know, that the whole, the whole boat rises uh, economically. And, and then around the world, you know, we just, we just have to be a guarantor of peace and stability as much as we possibly can. We've had some missteps, you all know that, uh, but it's still true that until recently, People look to us, look to this country, look to this city, look to that Statue of Liberty and said, man, that's where I want to be if I yes. can possibly be there. Or equally important, that's what I want my country to be and stayed and worked and fought and died to make those changes so that more people could have freedom. So it's, you know, it, it is so true that we've got everything going for us, and I don't want to see us blow it. And that is unfortunately well, what I fear right now. Uh, but it's so refreshing and so inspiring to hear you reconfirm um, that democracy is not a spectator sport, and we all need to be deeply engaged, especially now. And, and what ties us together is a notion, it's a belief, it's, it's not a genealogy. Um, and it's fragile, and we have to all, we, every single generation has to dig in and be part of it, otherwise we could lose it. And I think part of what we're seeing these days is that threat of losing something incredibly special and rare, and it's very difficult to get back. Well, it, it is, and I, I don't think we're there yet, and I hope we never are, but I think it's really important for young people, many of whom are here in this crowd, to recognize that this generation of young people um, has more at stake than anybody else in making sure that we don't fall and, and give up on what makes us uh, such a, a great hope for ourselves and others. And, you know, I, I keep mentioning this election in November because People who care about any of these issues, anything we've talked about or anything that might be on your minds, really, it is the most important act you can take uh, to try to bring us back, bring us back into uh, a, an effort to have a more perfect union. And so I hope that everybody here is registered to vote, and I hope you all will vote. In the so we'll come back to how, how 
all people, especially young people, are getting more and more engaged and active. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about one last very important issue that's in front of us, which is the issue of the Supreme Court and the tilting of the court's um, ideology. So what advice would you give to senators who are con going to consider Judge Kavanaugh's um, nomination? And what advice would you give to lay people who are concerned that some of the rights that we enjoy could be rolled back, be they voting rights or abortion rights or LGBTQ rights? Well, I think those are legitimate concerns. And, um, you know, the, the, replace, the potential replacement uh, of uh, Justice Kennedy is so consequential uh, for these human rights, uh, for women's rights and LGBT rights. And, uh, this, this nomination could determine uh, the court's direction for a very long time. So I would just make three quick points. One, um, there is a protocol that has been followed with prior uh, nominations, particularly uh, uh, with Justice Kagan, where all of the writings that a nominee has done in prior positions, and in the case of Kagan, it was in the White House first for my husband, and then it was for uh, President Obama in the Justice Department. Um, and all of those writings, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pages, all had to be produced in order for the Senate to conduct its due diligence on what the nominee uh, believes. And you, of course, in a case like uh, Kavanaugh, you'll look at his, um, his judicial opinions, but that's only a part of his career. Uh, so I think that the protocol and what was done for prior appointments when they were made by a Democratic president should be followed this time. Uh -huh. Now, you know what's going, you know, you know that's, the Republicans are gonna try to avoid that because they wanna get this nomination up to the Senate and hopefully confirmed before, before the midterm election. And so they can be held accountable because they demanded certain things and, and those things should be applicable here. Secondly, I think if you're, if you're concerned about any issues, and it's not only the ones I mentioned, you mentioned voting rights. We've had a terrible gutting of the Voting Rights Act and I saw the results in my election and I see it all the time. We also opened the door to undisclosable dark money with the Citizens United decision, which is an abomination. And I said when I was running that I would you know, do everything I could to overturn it, including uh, going to the extreme step of a constitutional amendment if the court continues to claim that it's free speech and they, they can't do anything about it. I disagree with that. I've made that clear. Um, gun rights, another issue. Uh, corporate power. I mean, the extension of more and more power uh, to corporations is all out of balance. I mean, part of what is so great about our system is the checks and balances. And that's not only within government, that's within various aspects of our society. And that includes corporate power. It needs to be checked and balanced, just like, you know, every other kind of power. So all of these are issues that could change our economy, change our government, change our politics, change our, our, our social progress. So if you're members of any groups that care about this or even just as an individual, you know, let your, let your senator know. Obviously, some states, they've already spoken out. Um, so then let somebody else's senator know. I mean, let people know that it's being watched. And then finally, I, th I think that trying to extend to more people the importance of the Supreme Court decisions would be critical because Republicans have historically understood that, Democrats haven't, um, and now everything is coming to a head with this nomination. So this has to be a voting issue, and I hope that it will become one. Yeah. Um, now, I knew that when, when we were gonna have this conversation that there would be a lot of grim topics that we'd be covering. So I want us to, to end with a focus on bright lights that, are, that we also see around the country. Um, since January 2017, people have taken to the streets and raised their voices in ways, <clears throat> excuse me, 
in ways we haven't seen for a long, long time. Um, everyone thinks this is a new age of activism, and we put together a, a short video, two-minute video, with some images for the last 18 months that I wanted the secretary to see because I think it's going to lift all of our spirits. the United States of America. <laughs> That's where I want to live. <laughs> I, I, really, I really think people have found how much it matters that they speak out and be part of these movements uh, to reclaim um, our future and to give voice to everything that we disagree with, that we oppose. And I'm thrilled, I mean, just looking at that and and knowing how much energy and commitment uh, went into it. And now we have to keep it going. We cannot stop. And we have to be supporting each other. You know, it's kind of exhausting to be part of uh, protesting and marching and demonstrating and resisting, but we cannot stop. And I'm hoping that everybody we saw there, even in the huge crowd shots, is registered to vote and will actually come out and vote in November because uh, we can march all we want, but if at the end of the day we don't win elections of people who will stop what's happening now and try to bring us back to a, a more unified understanding of, of what we should be focused on and supporting and stand up for our country and our democracy against Russia or anybody else, um, I, I do worry about our country's future, but that's not going to happen because the optimism and the energy yeah. here and we saw there is going to make sure we go out and we do what we must come November. I love it. All right. All right, you great crowd. I think there's no coincidence that all of that started 18 months ago, and it has everything to do with this unbelievably wonderful national treasure of a woman, Hillary Clinton. <laughs> 